It's my pleasure and honor to introduce you to the MITRE Corporation's Early Career Research Program. For the past three years, MITRE has invested $1 million each year to develop science, technology, engineering, and mathematics leadership. Created within MITRE's Innovation Program, the Early Career Research Program helps develop critical leadership skills, including how to perform research, how to manage a research project, and how to communicate results effectively. The Early Career Research Program is highly selective, and each participant pursues a particular research challenge under the careful guidance of an experienced research mentor, often simultaneously pursuing an advanced degree. Many participants work half-time on the direct program, accelerating transition of their research to MITRE sponsors. Now in its third year, the program has contributed to the development of 20 extraordinary individuals. Prior participants have had their work externally recognized, for example, as best papers at conferences and even acquiring direct funding from the government. So, please lean forward and enjoy meeting one of MITRE's early career researchers. So let's just let's jump right into it. Um, so, so, so let's start off with, with a story or really more of a, a fairy tale. So um, one day, an incident happened. Once, sure. Once upon a time, I, I, I like one day. You know, once upon a time is getting a little cliched. And so, an incident report was written. The report was filed in a system, and then this is the this is the cliche deconstruction. Everyone lived happily ever after, because now the incident has been dealt with. Um, so, it doesn't quite work out um, so neatly. Um, and here you can look at two random kind of samples of incident reports from different areas. You notice. Yeah, there's check boxes, nice structured text parts of them, but the bulk of them is, you know, this little area for narrative or what happened where someone has hopefully typed and in unfortunate um, places handwritten what happened in your incident. And this is going to get filed somewhere, and if you're lucky, OCR'd. And maybe someone will read it, but if there's a lot of them, maybe no one will read it. Um, and you know this doesn't just apply to incident reports. It applies to any large amount of um, unstructured kind of event descriptions you want to process to learn something about in the aggregate. So if you're trying to, say, read a bunch of news reports, um, you'd like to say maybe at the end of the month or at the end of six months or at the end of a year, look and say, look through all these and say, you know, what are my big incident problems? What what are, what are am I having issues with needles in a hospital or wheels on airplanes? And you can say, how many, how many incidents have I had with that? And if there's not a checkbox for them, you don't have that structured data unless someone's processing these. So how do we process these? Well, that's the, the great realm of information extraction or natural language processing or whatever you want to call this. Um, the image shown here is uh, one of the neat tools in this area called Gate. You can see that um, just it's just sample text. You know, It very nicely processes the, this out into... Um, tagged entities, which you see in colors there. I mean, Black Sea is red because it thinks that's a, a location, and Sunday is blue because that's a, a time, or more specifically, a day of the week. And so it, once you have these incident reports or news articles as text that you can process, you can try to, to pull out the concepts that you're interested in in these, and you can maybe start to get an idea of this incident is about wheels in my aircraft or about needles. So maybe at the end of a month, you can start to look through and say, well, I keep seeing you know, needles appear, and I have this context that tells me that it's the focus of the event or incident. Maybe I can start to say, well, maybe we should be focusing resources in this area. So have we solved this problem? Kind of. Um, not as good as we'd like. <laughs> so this kind of system, you'll run it, and it'll work great for a while. But you can start to run into these kind of this gradual continental drift of problems. So it works great until maybe the nature of your data starts to dr change or drift. You have new people in the company writing new, in new incident reports in slightly different ways. They don't look the same as they used to. Or you can change your processing pipeline. Maybe you think, well, I need to fine tune this to get a better result. But when you're doing that, you're causing a drift in what your results look like. Your, your, your baseline starts to shift. Maybe before when you were picking up these needle incidents, maybe now you're not picking them up as often as you should be. 
Um, and so everything seems to be fine. Like your system isn't crashing, but now your, your results aren't consistent with what they were before when this was important. And kind of as you try and fix one thing, you change the system a little bit, or you change the input a little bit, and the system drifts a little more. And eventually, you're not sure if you had the same system that you had a year ago. You're not sure if you had the same type of results that you had a year ago. So this kind of issue is very difficult to solve. How do we try to solve it now? Well, we try to solve it with what gold sets are basically you have a few documents, a few incident reports, or a few news articles where you know the answer because you had a human go read through them and solve the answer. You had the human mark all the entities with the, nice, with the correct colors and mark all the places. And then you'll keep occasionally rerunning your system on these documents and making sure it gets the correct answers. But that's only good if those answers are relevant, um, basically, to your data set. Um, if those documents start stop well representing your input because your input has drifted, that doesn't really work out very well. So what can we do different? Well, what I brought to this from kind of a, a partial computer security background is um, what, what was mentioned actually in the previous talk of anomaly detection. What if instead of the, the gold set approach where we run the processing pipeline and see if the, and know the answers and say are the answers right or wrong, well, what if we just look at our answers over time as we've been running this system for a year and say, you know, are our results different from what they were before? Um, do, they, do, they still, do they still look the same in terms of um, uh, quality, in terms of the fact that, you know, I'm still getting this many people, this many organizations, my still people are about the same length, kind of pull away from the fact that I know the answers, stop thinking that you know the answers, but suggest that you know, an incident report, even if, the, even if your terminology is changing a little bit, an incident report tends to still have the same basic structure. It's still the output of a correctly tagged incident report is still going to kind of look the same in the aggregate sense. Um, and this picture represents you know, what anomaly detection will bring you in a, in a computer field, you'll detect maybe a denial of service attack because there's been a sudden spike in access to your server one morning only on Fridays instead of on all the other days. And you maybe suggest that, you know, something's going on there. Why is everyone interested in me on Friday morning between the hours of 6 and 8? Um, and maybe there's a real reason or maybe there isn't. In this case, you know, maybe after someone, and maybe after someone makes a minor change to your pipeline, you'll start to notice, well, I'm suddenly detecting lots more places than people. Maybe that's an issue. Maybe it isn't. Or maybe you just notice that that drift occurs after a long time. Maybe that's because the data changed. Maybe it isn't. So we want to investigate, you know, whether that holds true. Because that is a, that, that is an untested hypothesis right now that the that correct results for incident reports will continue to look the same over time, even if you make minor tweaks to your pipeline, or even if there are minor changes to your, your incoming incident reports, or your incoming news articles. So here's how I approached um, initially kind of testing the viability of whether, whether this hypothesis is even true so that we can begin to use this method. Um, first, I had to, to identify a, a large enough um, corpus to basically practice on to be my huge number of incident reports or huge number of, of news articles. And in this case, um, I ended up using the, the Enron email corpus because it was readily available to me and I already had, um, I already had a, a gold set or a training set as it got repurposed. Um, um, other data sets were, were difficult to obtain and that will um, come up later. <laughs> um, so the idea I had was that I had this gold set for the Enron email corpus. Let's imagine just that it's five emails. I'm simplifying this, but we'll say it's five emails. Call them a, emails A, B, C, D, and E that are already correctly tagged. And so I can build a model for the whole corpus based on those emails by, by training on them um, and then processing the whole corpus. Um, so I said, well, what if I build five separate models? In the first model, I'll only train on one of those emails, email A. And the second model, I'll train on two of them. The third model, three. The fourth model, four. The five model, all of them. 
Presumably, the fifth model should be the best model because it uses the, the most emails. It has the, the best representation of Enron emails among the whole corpus. Whereas the first model with the, the smallest amount of training data should be the worst model. And you can kind of see this if you, um, if you just test them against the whole gold set. That, you know, obviously five, if you run it on all five emails, does well. One, if you try and use one to find the answers for B, C, and D, and E, it doesn't do as great. And so my notion was that if I ran, used all these five emails to process the whole Enron corpus, I should be able to see that the results from five look more correct, even without knowing the answers for all of the Enron corpus. So here's kind of what that looks like. We use those five models, um, and for each of them, we process all of the approximately 500,000 Enron emails. And those give us results on all five models for each email. So for every email, result for model one, two, three, four, and five. Take a few of those emails and use them to train a classifier for which model produced this set of tags for that email. So I know that, say, you know, model one produces a few emails that look like this, that tend to have this um, tag structure, that tend to have, you know, this many this many places, this ratio of places to people, tags at this length. And then for all of my remaining emails that were produced with various different models, see if I can then classify them based on those training results. You know, looking at just a few of the emails, can I start to say, based on what the tags in this email look like, it was produced by the better model, model five, because I know that the better model produces results that look different from the worst model, just in terms of ratios of tags and lengths of tags. And it turned out that that actually worked extremely well. So in fact, just reducing the data set to the quantity of tags for each, uh, the quantity of tagged entities of the various types, um, places, people, organizations, um, email addresses, and money, and such as that. Um, uh, it was actually very easy to, to, to get a classifier to do extremely well um, on picking out which model generated this email result. Um, in particular, some of, the, um, some of the entity types tended to be too aggressive, um, and it's how I thought of it. For example, um, in terms of money, trying to identify money values in email, as you had less data in the model, it tended to um, classify things that were numbers but not actually money as money. And so um, adding more data tended to result in fewer money tags um, in a correct, in a, um, basically more correct generally le meant less money. And in other cases with like IP address and locations, more correct tended to result in more of those tags. But it wasn't just a straight, um, it wasn't just a kind of a straight monotonically increasing thing. Using a, looking at the, using a decision tree classifier and looking at how it bounded these things, there was kind of a, a sweet spot where it thought that this was the ratio of various tags that were in the more correct, um, the model five results. Um, so that kind of led to kind of this clustering idea in a sense that the Enron results, when they're good, they look like this. They have this ratio of places to people. And you can start to see that, you know, if you're moving away from that, you think maybe you're moving to a worser model. In other words, your results are getting worse. Um, but one of the issues I had with that was that second best was hard to differentiate. Model four that was only missing one of the emails did almost as well as model five. And in fact, if you just looked on the gold set, it was hard to differentiate model four from model five because just adding that one last email only added a small bit of accuracy. Um, and so I wanted to see, you know, could I get even better? Could I, could I basically get my classifier to say that I know you've used a model now that's only slightly worse and that your results have only gotten slightly worse than the best results you've ever had. Um, and so I created, I still have model five, which is the best model, but now I have four weaker models that are all weaker in slightly different ways. They're, they're slightly um, reduced versions of the best model. And so again, I used all of those to, to process the, um, the, the Enron corpus, and as before, tried to differentiate between them, tried to see if I could um, identify the best model and separate its results from the results that were all slightly wrong. Um, and I had limited success at that. So by basically, you still see that there's this, this sweet spot where the Enron results um, 
have this ratio of tags that says that you know this is the the, the better results. This is what your Enron is supposed to look like. But a lot of the the models that are supposedly slightly wrong because they have less training data are all very near that. So if you try and um, if you try and get good detection on model five, basically have all your your classifier always get model five right. It tends to um, classify about half of the other models, about half of the results from all the other models as being in the model five. So you're only um, you're only cutting out actually a little bit more than half of them you're cutting out. You're saying, yeah, I can tell these are all from one of the weaker models. Which is, um, you know, it's not terrible, it's actually usable um, because you're, you're minimizing your, basically you're minimizing your, um, so you're maximizing your true positives that you're not saying, you're not being in model five, but saying that you're wrong, so you're not throwing up flags when you don't need to. Um, you're basically, you're only throwing up flags when you're starting to get pretty sure that, you know, you're using a worse model. Um, I would have liked to have been able to, to do this on some other data sets. I tried to get, um, I tried to get um, Twitter data, but it was a little bit um, painful. And also, um, I wasn't sure how well that would have, um, how well that would have tagged up, but it would have definitely been a different um, notion because there would have been a completely different sweet spot for that kind of data if there was one at all. I'd like to show that the same technique works on different data sets even though obviously the, the what good Twitter results look like is not going to look at all like what good Enron email results look like. Um, and I'd also like to incorporate supervision into this model basically to say that you know if, if once I've identified that the, the nature the the, the look of an output result has changed. Um, I'd like to be able to say, well, have someone come back and say that I actually think that got better and then redefine what my sweet spot is. Right now, we're just, you know, alarming that there's been a change. Um, but the, the biggest thing is that I'm hoping that we can integrate this tool into an upcoming um, a MIP project in the, in the data decisions, um, data to decisions area. Um, that's trying to, to build a generalized pipeline to do this kind of um, processing and um, knowledge derivation. And this, I'm hoping we can turn this into a tool that will run inside their knowledge store and can provide this kind of um, health and status or quality assurance um, tool so that it will be able to start throwing up flags after um, a long period of running the pipeline, starting to say, you know, your results look different and they look different in this way because you have this change in the and the distribution of tags and you know maybe you should investigate whether that's an issue maybe related to a change of the pipeline or a change in the data um, which you know can be useful in terms of again avoiding that that drift issue and that's the content of my presentation if there are any questions, um, I'll answer the first one. What you're seeing is a weka. It's a flightless bird, and it's also the name of the um, the, the classification tool that I use to, to do the, the classifying and the clustering. Thank you, Nathan. I have a question. Um, as you alluded to, the, uh, the corpus of uh, email messages will be uh, vastly different, one would expect. So, for example, if, uh, you know, if you're, it's a financial services uh, company like Enron that's one set of messages, you can imagine a set of messages with respect to, let's say, a target from the previous talk. Very different set, you know, product numbers that would confuse the, the numerical detection of IP addresses and so on. Um, and you can even imagine a very different kind of data set. For example, let's say an uh, information security uh, data set from here at MITRE yes. uh, related to a bunch of messages. Again, very different. So my question is, uh, since clearly the, the, the statistics and the distributions will be radically different, my question is, did you look at all, <clears throat> or do you have any thoughts about how you would predict the coherency of a data set? So if, if you know they're going to be different, uh, one of the things that would be interesting is predicting the next message that comes out, right? Because you want to support the next you know, target you know, uh, customer service or, um, or financial services. So do you have a sense you know, of, of how likely it is there, there are going to be outliers or how coherent the data set is over time uh, that might help you predict future performance? So I don't, it didn't immediately occur to me 
that there would be value in that, I have to admit. So in a sense, you can think of what this is doing as predicting the average next message. In other words, it's predicting, predicting what it expects results to look like, what it expects the next tag document to look like. But that's in a, in a very aggregate sense. It's, when I was doing this processing, I wasn't looking at one document at a time, although I tried to, to in the, the simplest notion, describe it like that. I looked over a processing run that consisted of, say, a thousand emails to try and say, you know, are these results like the others? Because any one email can be, you know, an extreme outlier. It can, first of all, it could be, you know, a spam from the outside. It could be maybe someone misclicked send and sent an email with one character in it. Um, and well, I could imagine a way. Basically, no matter no matter what the um, what no matter what the the diversion is from the mean, um, you're still you're predicting the mean kind of next message with this technique. The question is identifying identifying how far away um, how often messages are outliers. You know, have the coherence of the the data set. Um, I hadn't really found this technique applicable to that question. I guess <laughs> is is the, the best I can say. So when Paul Melby was here at MITRE, he did a wonderful job in trying to do this on aviation safety reporting system data. So again, looking for trends, trying to come up with models. One of the issues that was identified in early on Paul's stuff was the effect of fatigue on both pilot performance and air traffic controller performance. So that goes to your prediction, but it's more like a mean. Where's the big trend now, right? So have you considered looking at some of the data on the CASD side of the house, the FAA side of the house? Um, so. <laughs> Joe's <laughs> trying to tell you to say it. Yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of data I, I would have looked at. There, because I was coming at this from an NLP issue, originally there's a lot of um, NLP test data sets. And I tried to get access to a few of them, and each of them I basically would have had to go through kind of licensing with legal. And I really didn't want to have to deal with that at the early stage of my project because I wasn't familiar with it at all. And kind of like, you know, they ask you to, to come up with can charts and stuff and list your risk. And this risk was like, it needed to be in font size 40. Um, and I was like, but you know, then I have this Enron corpus, and I, I basically I stole it from another project which had just been able to just been using it, and so its risk was you know in font size eight. And I'm like, well, you know, this is this is good for me to start with the project. Um, so you know, if I kind of have the w with the leeway to 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 go more into exploring explain, exploring the idea further, yeah, I'd love to definitely. <laughs> the next step is kind of to to start looking at d data sets in radically different domains. Uh, and another uh, possibility, just to, um, the next steps, would be to try to correlate the changes as, or the trends that were just mentioned with some external variable that you could uh, uh, control. I mean, you could observe. For instance, I mean, just going simply in the in the in wrong example you gave, how you would correlate the trend in certain tags versus the instability of something, or in the safety, how would you correlate some trains with change of some rules or try to, to run that data and against some external, to try to see how some external variable correlates with that. That could be some, something interesting to, mm. to do on that. Yeah. So, wow, it's getting very deep in NLP, which is not entirely my background. Part of um, what I was bringing to this and what got me interested in it is because I do um, software engineering work with a lot of the the NLP with a lot of um, NLP researchers. Um, so part of my goal for this project was to, to kind of abstract out the, the NLP knowledge, and that's why we're trying to, to look at the results without needing to, to understand why the, why the um, training documents are producing the, the answer, producing the model that they are, which is um, getting to the answers um, it is. Um, yeah, that's definitely worth exploring, but it would be far outside my level of expertise at this moment. Do you think there might be an implication uh, when you go over a test data and try to find out uh, potential fraud? I'm giving are a keynote speech on the topic uh, in, in about a month, so. Are, are you to referring to specifically right? like the idea in uh, a fraud in terms of uh, writing a fraudulent report or a fraudulent email talking about like fraud occurring in Enron? Um, 
So I had considered this, and it's possible, but I don't think this is the, the best application um, for solving that. So one of the ways is to theorize that you know a person a person who's writing, say, for uh, going back to the incident report example, you could you could hypothesize that a person who's writing a false incident report um, writes it differently than a person who writes a true incident report. The fact that they're they're committing fraud in their mind influences the way they write, and so it actually creates um, a pattern that looks different when you process it and when you tag it, um, and that's. One of the one of the applications I considered for this, but because I was kind of coming at it from a health and status um, point of view, it wasn't my focus. And also, I think I think if you made it your focus to detect fraud, you'd find um, a better way to do it than this specifically. Um, to a better way to approach the notion, because you'd you'd probably specifically not just try and different. You'd not just try and do a two cluster and hope that comes up to separate true and false, but you'd actually try and identify what the habits are of a person writing a false incident report and specifically look for those. Um, so basically, I think it could be, but I think you'd be um, kind of rigging it to do that when it's not the best solution. I actually was just wondering, um, did you try any other uh, classification algorithms outside of a decision tree? And um, also, uh, I guess, why did you settle on a decision tree? Well, so yeah, actually, I, I used several um, classification algorithms. And in the, in the first step, when I was um, doing those sequential models where um, model one was very bad, model five was very good, um, you know, um, any classification algorithm you pick could actually... Um, not any, but a lot of the a lot of classification algorithms were basically able to to do all of those uh, with extremely high scores, except for um, separating four from five, which were very close. Decision tree was um, important because I was able to 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 look at the the prune decision tree and determine where it thought the where it thought the big decisions were in terms of saying that you know, like I said before, when I was able to identify that you know money tended to be aggressively overtagged. I was able to determine that by looking at the decision tree, by seeing that it was able to say that that it had come to the conclusion that certain tags were certain of the certain types of entities were very important in distinguishing model one from model two from model three from model four, and where it thought those breaks were. And it's harder to 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 pull that information out from some of the other classifiers. But um, so decision tree um, decision tree classifiers led me um, to a lot of. Led, looking at the decision tree led me to a lot of my earlier realizations, but I also um, used um, uh, nearest neighbor classifiers and k-means in particular um, uh, tended to do well identifying, separating the, the best from the second best in the problem. Um, sure. Uh, I guess in the future you might also want to consider uh, random forests, um, which will also give you um, basically the deciding uh, uh, variables that are important to the classifying. Uh, okay. like features. Thank you. Can you tell us what you learned about conducting research and particularly conducting it at MITRE through this project? Um, particularly about MITRE. Well, I'd say the the most important thing I learned was keeping um kind of kind of keeping a a set of short-term goals in mind, kind of um always focused on, you know, what am I accompli what am I going to accomplish within the next month or the next two months so that there were there were many different directions I could have taken um, at different points, you know, I different different ideas that interested me cause in, in, that all existed within the general approach I was taking. And so what I, I always had to kind of stop and think, you know, which which direction am I going to take that will that's not going to leave me just kind of possibly floating in the air exploring different ways without ever coming to a a, a grounded result? Um, and so I always was kind of you know, refocusing myself, thinking, you know, is the direction I'm going to go and lead me to where I want to be in a month, in three months? You know, what what outcome am I going to produce in the short term and in the long term? And always making sure that you know stopping every two weeks and making sure, am I still on track to, to accomplish something? Um, and specifically at MITRE, um, I'd say just kind of um, using and abusing the, the, the mailing lists as they're the, the best place to, to solicit information. Um, 
and to, to, to find people who have the, the expertise that you require to help you in your, um, your artificial intelligence queries.